Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. It's okay, well, how much was my grandfather responsible? Maybe he didn't go molest all these kids. You know, he molested some, but he taught people to do it. Yeah. So how much is he also responsible? The people who molested the kids are responsible. It doesn't matter if they thought that it was okay and they were being taught, you know, it doesn't matter. They still violated the principle. Mm -hmm. And that violation is absolute. You are still wrong. It was, it doesn't matter if you thought you were right. You can go kill somebody thinking you're right. You're still wrong. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces and things we may put up on the screen, go over to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. I love hearing your thoughts on the episodes, especially your words of encouragement for our guests who are bravely coming on and sharing their stories with you to help uncover these cults that need light shined on them. So today's guest, she was someone that I think you guys had mentioned in the comments a few times, and so I was happy to discover her. She is an author of Sex Cult Nun, great book. I'm almost done. I made it just to the end, and then we uh, we had our appointment to record, so I'm looking forward to finishing that. And she's also a TEDx speaker, an advocate, and attorney. So thank you so much for joining us, Faith Jones. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great. Yeah. So you grew up in the Children of God cult, and we've covered it a couple of times in previous interviews. I'm really looking forward to getting your perspective and your story because you grew up in Asia. So there were a lot of different things. You were moving around a lot. You came to the States at one point. You were in Russia. And for those who aren't familiar, it is a cult that essentially is like free love for everybody, but it's more mandatory. So all of that eventually translates to the children as well. So it does get pretty heavy and obviously there's abuse that goes on there. So I think we'll start, Faith, if you could just give us a brief overview for those who aren't familiar with Children of God, kind of where it came from and how you are related to the leader. So the Children of God was started by my family. Um, my grandfather was the guru prophet um, of the group, uh, but my parents were very active. My father, uh, they, they really uh, started the organization. It started in the late 1960s in the hippie generation. So uh, my grandfather's very radical message of kind of drop out of the system, you know, serve God full time, become a full time missionary. It was the civilization was ripe for that message, right? Mm -hmm. um, there was a new movie that came out called Jesus People, I think. I think that does a good job of showing how it started early on. Um, I, I don't think it's specifically about them, but actually it was about them. They were, they were the Jesus people too. They were a huge part of starting that movement. So the stuff that's portrayed in that is a lot of what it was like uh, in the early days. Now, in the early days, it was still much more strictly following sort of uh, traditional Christian mores, right? Like no sex without marriage and so on and so forth. It wasn't until some years later that my grandfather began getting all of these revelations about, you know, free love, free sex. Um, the wife of one is the wife of everyone kind mm -hmm. of a thing. And um, I would say that he had always had issues, I think, dealing, uh, following, you know, I mean, I think he had affairs, you know, as his older daughter writes about in one of his, her books, he had had affairs and stuff. So he... He wanted more of that, and I think he kind of created a a religious doctrine <laughs> to justify his own Jeez. desires. And sadly, that is what happens a lot in mm -hmm. these types of organizations, uh, particularly ones run by men, <laughs> mm -hmm. where they justify their sexual inclinations um, by coming up with some kind of you know God given revelation that yep. that's what God wants us to do, right? So in that sense, it's pretty typical. <laughs> but but um, what happened was he there was a young uh, a young new recruit 
Uh, her name was Karen Zerby, but she took the name Maria and uh, she was his secretary and he wanted to take her as another wife. And so they began an affair and, you know, so on and so forth. But even um, pr previously, earlier on, he had already had been, you know, engaging in, I guess, pedophilia really with his mm -hmm. own daughters to some extent. And that that's described by even his daughters. Um, one who described it in a very negative way, one who described it in a, you know, not in a negative way. Interesting. So that's not really a, it's not a, a guess. It's, you know, it's very much there. And that uh, doctrine also fed into the group as far as this being the norm of like, you know, it was a, a rejection against the, what he felt he had been brought up with, which was a very strict like no sex, shame, shame about you, your body, your sexual inclinations, everything as a child, you know, his mother did some things that like scared him, freaked him out. Um, but he took his concept and just kind of spread it <laughs> to everybody. Right. And was like, this is how you raise godly children who are, you know, not ashamed of themselves and their bodies and everything. But he was like actively promoting pedophilia yeah. within the group. And so, you know, in the book, I give some of my early experiences with that, you know, observing people having sex and um, being, having to participate, like in jacking off a, an older man and other things like that when I was very young, when I was a child. At the time, because I, I didn't realize it was bad or wrong, you know, it's just like I had a sense inside of myself that this wasn't right, you know, mm -hmm. but I also... You know, I was told that this is fine, this is normal, this is healthy, godly, right? This is what I was being told. So I didn't like suppress those memories, I think, as a lot of people do or might have. I was just like, oh, this is interesting. Okay. <laughs> you know? So when I write the book, I try to describe it like how I felt at that time, not as a look back. I'm writing really in the present moment of yeah. where my mind was in that time and how I was perceiving it and taking in these experiences in a different way. Cause I can remember that even, even at that early age, I remember it. Uh, I was very aware. And I think, you know, that's one of the things about living in a, an environment where you suffer abuse, not just that kind of abuse, but also like there was a lot of physical, um, like very harsh spankings and discipline and stuff like that. So you had to be very, very aware of your surroundings, of the adults, of their reactions and so on, so that you could uh, try to navigate that with as little uh, pain as possible. So I think that made me very aware of what was happening around me um, from a very young age. But just the the narrative was always in a positive way, right? So it's, there's this weird juxtaposition when you read the book because you're seeing it through my eyes and what I'm being told, but you're also seeing what's happening and you're saying, oh my God, that's actually really, really bad, but she doesn't yeah. know it, right? So um, I wanted people to be able to be in the moment with me, but as, as the reader, right? But also I think it's very hard for a lot of times when you read these cult books to be like, how could they have done that? How could they have thought that? Or how, you know what I mean? So I wanted to take people through that thought process to see, oh, they were seeing it like this. This is yeah. how they were, why they were doing this that way, right? Because that develops more of an understanding of how this could happen to people. Um, one of the questions I get a lot is like, you know, why do people join cults or how could they have let that happen, right? And it's not till you're in it that you can really realize how that can happen, how that can take mm -hmm. over your, your uh, mentality, your psychology, right? Because people don't join cults. I say they join families. Right. The best target people <laughs> for a cult are actually smart, um, very idealistic people who are willing to be sacrificial, people who are hard workers. These are actually the, the best target market. <laughs> Yeah, the good-natured people. Yeah, good-natured people that you can deceive and take advantage of and get them on board with whatever your agenda is and make them believe that this is going to help them and help the world, And right? So I also wanted to show that because, you know, in many ways, a lot of the people, there were some really terrible people in the group, 100%. And there were people who joined, I think, who were genuinely... Uh, pedophiles, right? And they took right. advantage of that. Then there were other people who kind of were like, well, this makes me uncomfortable, but 
you know, they say to do it and this is what God wants. So I'll do it, you know, but then they didn't really pursue it. And after they were very relieved when it stopped, you know, so there's kind of this mix that, that goes into this. I think it's important to understand that as well. But one of the things that I talk about is like, how did, how did people get sucked into this? You know, how did they believe it? And so, and for years, I pondered that question, like 20 years, I was like, I just don't understand, <laughs> you know, how, how did this happen where you had these people who had this very idealistic vision of saving the world and helping others? I mean, we did humanitarian work all over the world. I, I worked with orphanages. We brought in humanitarian aid. We did all the, we did a lot of good things. Like we generally wanted to help people. And yet there was all of this abuse, deep seated abuse within the group. How did people agree to participate in this, right? And so I finally narrowed it down. And that's what I really, the, the meat of that is what I get to in my TEDx talk. And that is a concept of making people believe they don't own themselves, yeah. that they don't own their own bodies. That's the core. If you can get someone to believe that, then you can take away all of their other rights, right? And so that was the core of the deception. And um, once somebody really understands that they fully own themselves and they take back that power and that right, then it's much harder to deceive them or get them to engage in these types of things, right? It's much harder to be taken over. Oh, absolutely. Because cults often take over your entire identity. They take over your sense of self. They take over your individuality. And they say, give yourself to God or give yourself to the church or whatever it is, name your organization. And so when something happens to your body, you just think, Either that's what God wants, maybe I'm a sinner, maybe I deserve it, or you're thinking, well, maybe it's a test, or maybe this, or maybe that, and you make all these excuses because you think that you don't own yourself, that your body is God's, your body belongs to someone else. And so just like you're saying, when you're able to take full ownership, you have more control. Of course, things can happen, but you have more control over at least just giving yourself a voice to say no, to stand up for yourself. Yeah. And, and, and it doesn't even have to be cults. I mean, think about it. There's organ, there's family situations like that, right? There's husbands who would wield that over their spouse, right? There's, or wives, right? There's, there's many different, um, and the, one of the reasons I wrote the book and I did the TEDx talk and everything was not just because of, of the group I grew up in, but because I saw this abuse happening everywhere in society. And I felt how important it was to help people understand accurate principles. And so my background as a lawyer really helped me to put that together and to simplify that. So really my background, both of being abused and being in the cult and, and then coming out and becoming a lawyer and, you know, having a sense of self and understanding principles helped me to say, okay, this is how we craft. What are the five basic principles of, our life code, our humanity, right? Our, this is our moral code as humans. These are the five things we should, these are the things we should not violate, right? And that is that each person has a property right, means they have full ownership of their own body, right? Which is why we don't allow murder, rape, assault, you know, because mm -hmm. all of those are violations of our right in our own body to be free from uh, attack, abuse, right? Um, and then when you take that to the next step, it is, if I own myself, then I own what I create, right? This is how we have intellectual property rights. So I own the painting I make, the service I create, I own all of that, right? Now in the cult, we didn't have that. I didn't own my body. The child abuse, or I should say the sexual child abuse, uh, ended kind of in the 80s to a large extent because of a number of reasons. They began to see it didn't really detrimental effects. And also uh, the authorities were getting called in. There were raids on the homes. They wanted to take the children away and stuff like that. So that they came out with a, you know, don't do it notification. And then there was a huge court case in the UK, which made them adjust their stance on like corporal punishment and spankings and like really excessive spankings, which is stuff that like, you know, you read about the story of my sister it happened to my brother as well where my father would give these just incredibly excessive 
spankings with this big like block of wood and stuff. You know, that was very terrifying because we all had to watch at any time. It was like public discipline, you know, discipline one, scare everybody else. So a lot of those things shifted as time went on, right? As the cult kind of grew up, you could say, right? And they began to get in trouble for different things. They, they changed those policies. But it didn't change the policy of the underlying fact of you don't own yourself. Yeah. So the shepherds would come in and do things like tear apart marriages. So the shepherds are like the, the overseers, the leaders, terminology. And so my parents were forcibly separated and we were sent away. My mother and two, you know, three young children were sent away. And that was an incredibly terrifying time for us. But they were just like, well, we don't think that your marriage is glorifying God or serving God in the best way. So we're going to separate you, right? So people had no rights in that sense, right? Like normally you would think of, no, this is my child. And, yeah. and people's children would get taken away. People were legitimately very afraid of that. Like if somebody wanted to leave the group, then their children, the other spouse who didn't, the, the group would help them spirit the children away. And, you know, they might not see them for years. They're in different countries, so they couldn't track them down. And then, you know, also like as I got older too, even, you know, with the nicer, friendlier cult right? <laughs> group that it kind of became a little more mainstream, but not really because even though, you know, they change it so you're not allowed to have sex till you're 16, you know, basically an adult, right? Um, it was at 16 if other people were also under 18, mm -hmm. right? But you, 18, you had to hit 18 before you could have sex with people who were adults. Okay. Right? And, and that kept changing because they would say that it, it, belong, it was dependent on what the laws of the country you were living in, right? So it kind of, it kind of shifted over time. So, you know, you, you ended up in this situation where as a woman, particularly, you were still being told what to do with your body, mm -hmm. right? So the time that we had talked about when I was in Kazakhstan and living in a small home there. And, you know, at this point I was like 19, right? And I was told by the shepherds that I needed to have sex with this one of the young men in the home because in the group, sex was seen as something to have a, it was basically seen as, as like a, a physical need. That was how my grandfather had talked about it, right? So he's like, the Bible says, if somebody's hungry, give him to eat. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. If he needs clothes, give him your cloak, right? So, and, and of course that's all legitimate, Yeah. <laughs> but in my grandfather's mind, the way he had built it up was sex was a fundamental physical need um, and that you should be required to give that to. To men. Right. Something that really struck me about the wording was was the sharing thing. They called it sharing. Don't you want to share God's love? And why aren't you yielding to God? And that chapter in your book where you're just like, I'm trying to do everything that I can. I just don't want to have sex with this guy. But if that means I need to be more yielded, then OK. And you just kind of had to grit your teeth and go through with it. Yeah. And at, and at that point, it was like, I was. I was living in a foreign country. I was doing volunteer work. I was, you know, really sacrificing myself, you know, my full time caring for other people's children, mm -hmm. you know, witnessing, preaching the gospel, et cetera. Like, but it was like, no, if you don't give this one more thing, you're not yielded to God. If you don't give your body and have sex with somebody that you don't want to have sex with, they considered it where you could be, you would be publicly humiliated, right? So like called out in front of the whole home as being unyielded mm -hmm. to God, you know, having prayer over you so that you would repent and stuff like that, right? It wasn't just like, I'm going to tell you to do it. If you don't do it, you're, you know, you're naughty, right? Kind of thing. So manipulative. It was, it was much more coercive than that. Yeah. And of course, for me, I genuinely loved God. I genuinely like wanted to please God. Um, you know, one of the questions you asked was like, well, did you buy into it? Yeah, I was like, I was committed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really believed in it. That was what I was raised. And I really wanted to please God. I wanted to serve others. I wanted all of those things. Right. But I just, in, inside of me, I had this revulsion to doing this thing, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and it was very, very difficult to overcome it. And so I talk about that in the book. I talk about like, the fact that we weren't allowed to use birth control and 
you know, just sort of the trauma of waking up in the middle of the night after these things and, you know, praying to God that I don't get pregnant, you know, and like, just, you know, like waking up, like <laughs> freaking out in the middle of the night, you know, it was just, and, and, and women did get pregnant. And the problem was that oftentimes if you got pregnant from somebody, uh, you would be forced to marry them, even if you didn't want to. Oh. So, you know, that, that fear was very, very real. <laughs> um, in the, in the group, even later on, you know what I mean? So even later on when it seemed to be more of a, you know, it wasn't, you know, committing child abuse and stuff like that. It was still very coercive, particularly towards women, but towards everybody, but particularly I think to women, because to them that was more of a sacrifice, right? They were asking the men to do that. (laughs) But that concept of not knowing you own yourself, right? A feeling like your body is is there for somebody else's use. And that's something that's still very common all throughout our society today, right? Men feel like they can take, they can, oh, well, I can touch a woman. Oh, she's, you know, it's not. They don't even have a sense of like, no, that's her body. She has full ownership. Right. They're like, oh, let me grab your ass or squeeze you or, you know what I mean? They don't have that boundary. And that's, that's throughout our society's in countries all over the world today, right? Where women are not given that full right of ownership in their body, that full autonomy, where it's not the expected thing where a woman would say, no, please don't touch me. I'm not comfortable with that. And so that's one of the things I talk about in my first book, which is called I Own Me, which is really getting women to sink that concept deep into their psyche of what it means to have self-ownership. And how you can express that to men who maybe, you know, not everybody's raised the same way. Not everybody's raised in the same cultures. You know, we see there's a lot more awareness of it in the West today because of all of the, you know, lawsuits and everything. But that's not true necessarily all over the world and in all cultures. Even in America, it's not (laughs) not true. I mean, I talk about in my book about going to conferences, you know, with all these guys and you know, marketing conferences and stuff like that, where I'm often, the, you know, one of the very few women there, right? And the way they treat you mm-hmm. and the way they, they think it's okay to just like touch you and put their hand on your back or rub you or, you know, things Ugh. like that. It's like, no, that's not okay without my permission, right? Like you can't just, you know, my body is not just here for you to rub up against, right? Right. And then if you look at like the statistics of rape, which I talk about in my TEDx talk are huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this country, like 25% of college women, I mean, we're not talking about uneducated women, we're talking about smart, capable women. So I just realized there's such an epidemic of it, which is why I wrote and spoke out and did the TEDx talk and all of this, you know. Right. I love so much that you've become an attorney and an advocate and you are speaking out because just knowing where you came from and what you had to do to get where you are today. Could you talk a little bit about the education or the lack of education and how you were just hungry for it? I think it was just so inspirational to read everything that you had to do just to get the education that you so desperately wanted. The group was good about teaching about like early, early education. They use Montessori methods, teach kids to read early and so on, but they didn't believe that you needed education much past like sixth grade. They figured you needed to read well so that you could read the Mo letters, which are the letters that, you know, the group put out and you needed to be able to do basic math and so on. But after that, your life was really funneled into taking care of children, cooking, going out, witnessing or proselytizing. And, you know, you, you know, you, they'd learn different skills You know, if someone was at a big home that was making videos or something, they would learn video skills. They learned skills pertaining only to within the group, Mm -hmm. right? You were not prepared at all to be outside the group. Um, You were never going to have a job. Nobody in the homes had jobs. Everything you had to just get through donations, right? Or through selling like the CDs and posters and things that the group produced, So their attitude was that you didn't need an education. I mean, you needed a basic education, but that was it. Obviously, outside books and things like that were a threat. At this point, we didn't have the internet. Most of us were living overseas. We didn't always speak the language that well. So it was quite easy to isolate us. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a little village in China, in Macau, uh, which was a Portuguese colony back then. 
and it's fascinating culturally place. Um, you know, we moved into this Chinese village with, you know, uh, my dad has two wives and seven children and then another family. We moved into this hundred year old Adobe brick house with an outhouse. Right. So I knew what it was like to live in a way that most Americans don't. Yeah. Right? At a very, very basic level. I, I'm just always amazed at my that my parents put up with that, that two women put up with that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, and they, they did their, they, they, they tried to educate us. Right. But, but there was a, a block there, right. It, it wasn't really acceptable. Um, but they, they actually, the mothers did try to, to give us an education at least to a certain extent. And then after that, you know, because of the groups kind of, the way it went, they would just, we would get pulled off into working, right? So we couldn't continue our education. And like, I mean, I started teaching when I was 10. I started teaching like little kids when I was 10, like three, four year olds. I remember I had gotten a hold of this one book that somebody had somehow, the combo that we were living in, so we called a combo if it was like over 60 people. So over time, lots and lots of people came and joined our farm community out there. And somebody must have brought this book somehow, right? And I found it in the trash. <laughs> and it was called The Secret Garden. And that was the first novel I'd ever read. And I fell in love. I just, I mean, I would sneak up to the loft where there was almost no light and I would like hide and read it. And then you like stuff it under these blankets so that nobody could find it and come downstairs. <laughs> and of course, when you're monitored all the time, it's very hard to find time to sneak away. And my sister, my older sister caught me. She was like, wanted to report on me. So I ended up getting in trouble for it. Was it because all books were bad or just certain books were prohibited? You were pretty much not supposed to read anything that wasn't either the Bible or produced by the group. Oh, that's very limiting. Yeah. yeah. Very limiting. So, but we, but the group produced thousands and thousands of pages of literature. So the group produced lots of comics for children. So taking the, the adult, the uh, doctrinal letters and putting them into a comic form mm -hmm. so that children could read them. So it did produce a lot of content for children, but it was still incredibly limiting, right? Because you're kind of reading the same stuff. I mean, I read the picture Bible like a thousand times, you know, <laughs> and I like I was so bored of it all, right? Anytime something new came out, I would read it instantly, yeah. but you know, that it was done. It was like short, right? And I wanted so, so to have concepts or things outside of that. We didn't have, you know, there were a few things they might let you read, like that they thought didn't have, you know, like we were very limited in the movies we could watch. They, they very much limited what came in to our sphere. So when I read that book, it was like, oh my God. Yeah. So we weren't really supposed to read novels or outside books. We didn't go to libraries. We didn't do any of that. Right. And um, it just, it opened my mind. I was desperate to get more. <laughs> I was desperate to find more books. So if some families were like a little more relaxed with their kids than other families, I would try to like see if they had any novels. Like I remember another family had like the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe series. And I would like, go there and I like <laughs> try to read it. But it wasn't until we went to the U.S. for the first time. And there was a whole other traumatic thing of, you know, being in Thailand and you know, when, when my parents were forcibly separated, we were sent to Thailand and then I was seen as being rebellious because I would speak up, you know, about certain things to the adults and so on. And so I was put on silence restriction almost immediately when I went to this new home in Thailand. It was this huge combo. Um, and I was like 12 years old, just before I turned 12, which meant 30 days of, uh, I couldn't speak for like 30 days. Wow. And I had to wear a big sign on my neck. Of course, I just moved to this home and I just moved in, you know, uh, all of us, like people my age, like 10 to 12, right? We all lived together. There was maybe 10 of us roomed in the same room, boys and girls. And, you know, here you come to this new home and you want to fit in and you're incredibly self-conscious about yourself. I mean, that age is just so, so tender, right? Yeah. To me, that was way worse than getting a beating, you know, was that humiliation and, you know, you can't connect with anybody in this place you've just moved to. So after experiencing that, and then my parent, my mother had a nervous breakdown and tried to run away and, <laughs> and then we got shipped to America 
And, you know, in America, we couldn't find a home to take us in because it was a mom and three kids, you know, and then the family was always preaching love and we care for each other. We take care of each other, blah, blah, blah. And here we're in the situation. Here's a mother, single mother now, because she'd been forcibly separated from my father and nobody would take her in. Wow. Permanently, you know. So we ended up getting sort of accidentally excommunicated from the family for a while just because we couldn't find a home who would put us on their report. Yeah. So we ended up going to live with my grandmother for about six months and she wasn't in the group. Mm -hmm. And this was my first time to experience life outside the group. And so it was actually a really good thing, even though it seemed terrible, terrible to us at the time. I went to school for a semester, like at a Christian school. And experienced for the first time what it was like to actually have teachers and, you know, because the, the family had this book called The Child Care Handbook and, and uh, it was about this big and that was like all the education you needed. It had math, science, history, <laughs> grammar, everything in this one book. That was it. <laughs> when you finished studying The Child Care Handbook, you were done with your education. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And I've been through that thing so many times. So to actually like go to a real school and learn subjects, other topics and other things, it was, um, it was amazing. It was very enlightening. And, but the first time my grandmother took me to a library and there were just like, there's thousands of these English books. I mean, I was like, blown just, away, I'm sure. Blown away. And I would take home stacks of novels like this big and hide them under my bed and I'd read all night and then I'd get up and go <laughs> to school. You know, oh I was gosh. just like trying to absorb as much as I possibly could. And my mind was so hungry. So it was a very difficult, very stressful time, but it was also a very enlightening time. And so when my father finally came and took us back to the group, he finally, he had been put on a, in a, a retraining breaking program. And so when he escaped that, he came and got us and took us back to the farm. And by this point, it was all emptied out. And, you know, we were kind of on our own out there. And I remember when I left, I couldn't really connect with the kids in the school because my life was just so different. You know, I mean, I'd had this whole other uh, life and and kind of uh, like a forced maturity level, right? Of having to take care of other people, having to become an adult at like the age of 12. So I didn't really relate to the other children, but I really liked the teachers. And I could talk to the teachers at a very adult level. And I remember when I left, the teachers were like begging me to continue my education. And so I promised I would finish high school. And my mother, who had gone through this whole thing with me, she had finally really realized that the family did not present the safety that she had believed in all that time, mm -hmm. right? So she knew that we needed to be prepared if we needed to leave again. She supported me in, in my decision to finish high school. She helped me get the books and stuff like that. And I just would study on my own correspondence course. I just get up and sit at my little desk and do the, you know, the correspondence course. It was like Christian Light, Abeka, and stuff like that. And that's how I finished high school for a few years. Wow. And my mother at the same time was secretly uh, working on trying to get her, her degree, her bachelor's degree. Oh, wow. That must have been difficult. There was like a program where you could use basically like your experience, life experience. You could get credits for stuff like that. So she was trying to do that. She was trying to work through it uh, as well. Because, you know, when we had when we had gotten kicked out, she didn't have her high school diploma. Although she was very, very smart, she actually did finish. She had great grades when she was in school. But she left, you know, to become a hippie right before graduation. And so she didn't have, like, she didn't have a college degree. It was really hard for her. She couldn't make enough money to take care of us, to make ends meet, you know? And just I'm experiencing that with her, where I'd have to go out on the streets with a can and, like, basically beg for money to feed, you know, the kids, to feed my younger brother and sister. Wow. That created a drive in me, I think, that really helped me later in life after I left the group. Um, I left the group because I just desperately wanted to expand. I just, my brain was so deadened by, by just reading the same doctrinal stuff over and over and over again, right. you know, and I, I wanted to go to college 
so I didn't leave the group because I thought they were wrong. I left the group because I wasn't allowed to get an education. Yeah. But once I did leave and I experienced life outside the group and I went through the process of it, it just, it, it takes time to shift your whole mindset, right? To, to escape that, that model of the world and that pattern. And so when, once I left and I was getting that education, I was building a whole new model of the world, really, you know? And after that, it would have been possible for me to go back completely. Right. Do you think that if you hadn't have gone to America, I know you were desperate for education, but you hadn't really seen what you were missing yet. Do you think if you hadn't gone to America, you wouldn't have wanted to leave to go to college? I think it definitely helped. I think having that window on the world uh, definitely helped. Mm -hmm. But there were other things like, like it was such a painful and stressful time too. So it didn't make it as attractive as right. it might have otherwise. But on the other hand, um, my grandmother used to, after we left the U.S. and went back to Macau, my grandfather would ma my grandmother would mail me these books, and we had she sent like a package of books. And it was like Anna Green Gables or Rebecca or, you know, these like 18th century women who, so all very good, like nothing negative or rebellious or anything, right? But these sort of models of these women who had to fight to get an education, to go to college, right? Because at that time period, that was very difficult to do. And I think that also just reading those over and over, I think that also instilled in me a kind of a, maybe a hidden desire for that, that I didn't yeah. even realize I had. So I think it's so important to share with people models of the world, to allow people to glimpse another life, another world, the possibility of that. Even when we're talking about like kids who come from really poor backgrounds or the ghettos or things like that, like giving them that chance to see this is what it's like to be outside. This is what it's like to live in a different environment. Because without that, how do you know what to strive for? Mm -hmm. If everything you see around you is just one thing, that's all you know of the world, right? Yeah. It's much harder. But when you see something like, ah, I could actually work for that and get that. I could go do that, right? It gives you a goal outside of that. And if you are the kind of person that is very driven, you could go and achieve that goal. You could go do something, you know? And so I think it's so important to give people windows into other lives and spheres. Travel is so important for that, you know? It opens our mind as to what's out there, different uh, concepts. It's not like everybody doesn't think the same. <laughs> everybody doesn't have the same opinion, right? We see this more and more in America where it's becoming more cult-like, really, where all of these groups are isolating into themselves and there are doctrines and they're not looking outside themselves. They're not engaging rational thinking. They're not a, you know, they're just like, oh, you're them, that's bad. Exactly. Or you must be evil, right? Instead of saying, well, actually, no, they make a really good point there. And these guys have a really good point here. If we actually look at it from a practical standpoint, like not this idealism mm -hmm. of whether it's a political idealism, you know, or, a, you know, some kind of ethos or something that they're promoting. It's like, no, you got to look at the facts and make a decision based on facts. And We've just so lost that in our society. It's it's really scary. Honestly, for me right now, seeing what's happening in American society is so scary because it not only has uh, a lot of elements of communist China where I grew up, but it has so many elements of the cult in it, but on a mass scale, right? On all sides. And that's, to me, quite terrifying. Yeah. You know? where you're not having the same kind of rational conversations we used to have about stuff. Right. People are just splitting on these political or ideological lines without engaging in real debate, you know? Yeah. When you get into these really hyper-focused perspectives and you just don't allow yourself to see anything other than what's right in front of you, what you've been taught or what you've been told, what you believe without questioning yourself, that's where it gets really dangerous. And I I love that you said that travel is a great way to expand your thoughts and your awareness. What I find interesting is 
within your childhood, you were traveling a lot to a bunch of different countries, but within that scope and that perspective of only what you've been told. So I'm wondering, have you ever gone back to any of those places as an adult having deconstructed and kind of take it in for the first time almost? Yes, absolutely. And I really, um, I really enjoyed that actually going back to these countries. I went back to Hong Kong when I worked there for a while as a lawyer. Um, I went back to Macau and visited. I went back, you know, I, 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 I lived in other countries, uh, but even, you know, even in the cult, my experience of the country still gave me a perspective of how the local people saw things, right? We were within our sort of group, but I still could see how the local people experienced things, how they saw the world, how they saw America, how they saw their lives, Uh you know, and that perspective when I came to America was I could still, um, you know, I, 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 it's like each culture was like a, a new culture for me. Right. So it wasn't my culture. I, each culture was a culture I learned so I could compare and contrast that our culture in the cult was its own culture. Yeah. Right. But it didn't mean I didn't see and experience the local culture. Sure. And see how they saw the world or experienced the world, right? So it was still very valuable, I think, as a perspective. But, uh, yeah, definitely. After I left the group, I went and traveled quite extensively. And, you know, I I loved it. I loved it. Uh, it's, It's important when you travel to not just travel as a tourist, though. Yeah. It, you know, it's important to go and try to spend some time living somewhere, like actually engaging with local people, having local friends. If you just go and you stay at another Hyatt or another Marriott, or you know what I mean? It's like, you'll go, you'll see some stuff and be like, oh, interesting, cool. But you won't ever really experience the world through somebody else's eyes. Yeah. Um, so I think not just travel, but actually staying somewhere. Immersion doing a volunteer trip, right? You're like people go and they build houses and they actually stay somewhere for some length of time and and really interact with people. I think that when I say travel, it's more that, not just like, oh, I'm going to Cancun for the week, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I would love to hear more about your exit because you said it was for education, not necessarily for the ideas or ideals of the group. So I imagine that deconstruction process would have happened very gradually once you were immersed in a new culture in college. What was that like? I mean, was there anything where you just realized that you didn't have really any real world world experience until you got there? What's going through your mind? Yeah. I mean, everything was new. You know, I'd never held a job. I was like, well, I mean, I, 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 when I left, I, I did get a job in order to teaching English in order to raise the money to buy my ticket to come to America because mm-hmm. I didn't have money. Because when they, when they, when you left the group, you left with nothing. <laughs> you know, so it also made it very hard for people to leave because you know they didn't have a support system or backup or anything. But yeah, everything was so different for me. You know, like you don't know how to interact with bosses. You don't know how to interact, you know, you know, everything is from the start. Like I remember I had this group of male friends and, um, that I kind of like got sort of semi adopted into this group of like five guys. And, you know, I have five older brothers. So, you know, I like, I was very tomboyish and I loved the, you know, I like, I, I felt comfortable just like being pals with guys and hanging out and, you know, and they'd go four wheeling and yeah. drum circles. It was just California, right? <laughs> so, but um, I was super confusing to them because like I'd show up and say hi and I'd go give them a big hug, like a full body hug, like, you know, your breasts pressed against them, everything, right? Because <laughs> that's, we were literally taught to hug in the family. Oh, like, wow. We were taught that you have to hug like this. Like if you did a hug like this where you're kind of like, you know, an A-frame hug, uh-huh. that was bad. That was not showing God's love, right? Oh. So, you know, you're just in the habit of, of, of like being affectionate like this because that's how I grew up. And, you know, and then the guy would think, and they told me this later. Right? <laughs> they told me at the time, they told me later. They would be like, oh, she must really like me. You know? <laughs> and then I'd go do the same thing to somebody else. Yeah. And they're like, wait a second. And they'd be all confused. <laughs> What was going on? You know, <laughs> um, you know, it's that kind of stuff. You just like you don't realize how different your culture is. Or the first boyfriend I dated, 
um, when I was in college, you know, and um, in the family we were taught because we would have these dance nights, right? It was like internal dance nights and, you know, teens and stuff would come from all over and we, you know, they'd play music and we'd all dance together. And we were taught never, if someone comes and asks you to dance, you cannot refuse, right? Because here they've worked up the courage and this and that. And, you know, I mean, you don't want to make them feel ashamed or embarrassed or, right? So you were just supposed to grit your teeth. And even if you didn't like them, you still had to dance with them. And so that was just so ingrained in me. And I remember my, my boyfriend took me out to like a Latin club. Nice. And he went to get some, he went to get some beers. And this guy came up and asked me to dance. And I, I said, yes, because I, I, I thought that that you had to say yes. Yeah. I thought that that was the, and he was so, my waiver got so mad. He stormed out of the club and I had to chase him down. And he literally was ditching me what? in a club in the middle of downtown DC with nothing. Right. And I was scared because I didn't know how to get home or anything. So he started storming out of the club and I chased after him. I was like, what's wrong? He was so angry that I had accepted a dance from somebody when I had gone there with him. You know, which now, of course, I understand, right? But yeah. at the time, because he didn't know I'd been in a cult, right? Because I wouldn't tell people anything uh. about it. Like, so there was just all of this cultural cues and stuff that just complete blank, like total miss all the time. <laughs> it was very difficult. Yeah. What well, was that experience like dating? Because you have all of these ideas about sharing love. And there was one thing that really stood out to me in your book where you mentioned that if you were to arouse a man, it was your duty to finish him. It's like, well, that's your fault. Now you have to take it the rest of the way. Did you have anything like that where you were trying to figure out your own baseline, your own boundaries? Yeah. I mean, that yeah, after I left the group, that definitely happened to me plenty of times where I was in those situations. And I just felt like I, you know, just from my training and background, I felt like I had to do it. I didn't want to. I didn't really like the guy, whatever. But I, you know, I was like, okay, well, I've got to do it. Yeah. Kind of a thing. And it's sad that, that, that even after leaving the group, I still had so much of that in me but I was still, it was still kind of forcing me to do that kind of stuff that I didn't really want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, another reason why I think it's so important for women to be trained in this stuff, because society also trained you that way. Mm -hmm. This was not just the cult yeah. that trained you that way. There's lots of, uh, messages to women in society about the same exact thing that you can't say no. Right. Or, you know, you teased him yep. or even within the legal system, you know, they're like, well, did you lead him on? Right. Really? Um, well, you were kissing him. So, you know, you were dressing sexy, right? This whole concept of like a woman le is leading a man on. And then if she says no, that's not necessarily valid. Right. Or if he pushes for something that she doesn't really want to do, if she led him on, you know, then that's kind of justified, which oh, it's not. No. That was why when I created the framework, it really crystallized those concepts for me in a way I, I didn't even understand myself. Right. Before. And the reason I, I talk about property rights is because we all have a very clear picture of what it means to own something, a, a piece of, you know, like if I own my cell phone, right? We all have a very clear picture of what someone can and can't do with my cell phone. Right. right? <laughs> um, and, and, and within our society that that's clearly delineated and, but that is not true with women's bodies. So by taking that concept and that principle and applying it to a woman's body, I can, I can see the boundaries much more clearly, mm -hmm. right? Like if someone takes my cell phone, that's stealing. doesn't matter if I left it on the table, they still stole it, yeah. right? If someone digs in and starts going through my phone, that's invasion of my privacy. That's a clear boundary. There's not a question there, right? But yeah. often there is a question. I can pressure you. I can touch you as a woman. I can pressure you to have to, you know, share things with me that you don't want to share, right? But we don't do that with our cell phones. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think it just, because we have a much clearer idea of that in our society, to me, using that as an example made it easier for me to even understand what my boundaries should be and could be and what I could demand, right? Yeah. And so that's that made a huge difference for me. And not everybody likes uh, the concept of, you know, talking about your own body as property, but 
to me, that really helped clarify it. And I think that for, especially for women who have been abused and struggle with those boundaries, there's plenty of people out there, you know, they, they don't struggle with that. They, they have very clear boundaries, but I'm not really talking to them, you know, <laughs> talking to the people who were raised without those boundaries, who had those boundaries violated so much that they don't even know where the boundaries should be. Yeah. I don't think there's any issue with talking about yourself as property as long as you're not talking about owning someone else as property. I think that's where it gets tricky. And that's the thing. You can't, right? You can't. So you have to, under, when you fully understand the principle, the reason that slavery is illegal is because we as a society accept that no one can own a living body other than the person whose body it is. Yes. Right. We cannot. You cannot own somebody else's body. You cannot give up that right mm -hmm. fully, right? You could license yourself out. You can have a work contract, right? But you cannot fully give up that right of ownership in yourself and in your body. Yeah. That, that would, that's slavery, right? And we don't, we don't accept that as valid. And that comes from a concept in the Bill of Rights. We're created with inalienable rights that we get from our creator, these inalienable rights that, you know, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have that in the American Constitution. Sadly, it was not applied to women or to people of color or to right. lots of, you know, when they first wrote it. But the concept was still correct, right? That each person, even each child, each individual has that inalienable right. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that as having come from your creator or whatever, or you can do it just from a simple moralistic standpoint. It doesn't really matter. But when you recognize that you have that inalienable right, that nobody can own you, and you recognize what the boundaries of those rights are, then you can step into your power in a whole new way. And that's why I, I talk a lot about like all of these things that we deal with, people guilting us, people applying peer pressure. You know, there's all of these concepts that you can actually just get rid of the negative impact of once you fully accept your full ownership in yourself. Mm -hmm. If I fully own myself, I fully own my time, my money, right? That I create, I own it, it's mine. I get to choose what I'm gonna do with it. And I can choose to do with it what is going to best serve me, right? And that doesn't mean being selfish necessarily fully, right? It's okay to be selfish, it's okay to do what's good for you as long as you're not harming others, yeah, right? But there's a lot of ways in which doing good for others does good for us too. <laughs> it makes us feel good. It makes us feel happy. Showing love to our parents and taking care of them, right? And getting mutual respect and love. And, you know, when you're in a relationship, it's all like you give love to that person. That person gives love to you. You cook for them. They thank you, right? It's like it's a continual back and forth of this um, harmonious giving and receiving, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't mean being selfish, but it also means recognizing that if someone is trying to pressure you, say, hey, you know, you need to be supporting our church or our bake sale or our whatever, right? Like by, by trying to pressure or guilt you, then that's wrong. That's a violation, right? Mm -hmm. If you're like, I love this, what these guys are doing and I want to support it, here's my money, great right? That's supporting something you believe in. That's great. But someone trying to pressure you or guilt you to do something, guys trying to pressure you to share your body, all of that, that is wrong. That is a violation of the principle. Mm -hmm. So it releases you from the negative side of it, I guess is what I would say. Um, the negative pressure side and allows you to be free to do it to share, to help others, to do it because you want to do it, yeah. not because somebody's pressuring you to do it, right? And in the family, and so many of us, we have that natural inclination. We want to help, right? That's great. But when someone comes and takes advantage of us by using our ideals to try to negatively pressure us to do something, that's when the violation is taking place. Yeah. And when you can recognize that, it's much easier to stand up against it. It's much easier to be like, hey, wait, no, actually, this is not my problem. You're the problem. You're the one creating the violation because I'm feeling this pressure and I shouldn't be feeling that. 
right? Yes. So it gives you that courage to stand up for yourself in a whole new way. It's so empowering. And I love these principles. And it seems so obvious when you lay it out, you know, like just comparing to having a cell phone. You're like, of course, no one is allowed to go through my phone. It's my phone. Don't touch it. (laughs) But then when you look at just even basic human rights and women's rights, especially, you're like, wait, why is that so unclear? Why Why do we have more clarity around our cell phones than we do around a physical human? being. So when did you come to recognize all of this? Do you remember, was there like an aha moment in school where you're like, oh, or was it kind of just slowly over time you put the pieces together? No, I mean, I really came up with this framework. I think it was like 2018 when I came up with it. It wasn't in school. It was long after I'd left school. In school, a lot of things came clear for me, like, you know, and and this was, I was dating a lawyer at the time and he explained to me how if I was being pressured, like the time I talked about in Kazakhstan, being pressured to have sex with somebody, even if someone wasn't holding me down, right? It was still rape, Mm -hmm. right? So those concepts started to become clear to me there, but I didn't really identify that this simplicity of the framework, that was really like an aha moment. It was kind of a eureka moment. It was like all of this stuff had come, been in my brain, you know, (laughs) chasing around. And I remember I was like, on an airplane sitting there and I started to draw the circle. So that was, I was actually working on creating like a coaching framework for executives and leadership about how to like strategize and think clearly and clarify decision-making in your mind. And uh, I was like, there's something really core here we're missing. And this is the property rights of our, you know, where, where, where do morals come from? Uh, you have to have a, a something that it comes from. It's not just some vague thing. It's not just some book tells you this, right? Like it has to have something rooted in reality. Mm -hmm. And so when I started with that concept, it was like, okay, well then what happens next? Logically the next step, the next step. Right. And, and then I, I remember I was just looking, I was like, oh my God. And I turned it over and I wrote on the other side, like all of the moral law fit into one of those rings, everything we consider the law. Yeah. And I was shocked at what I'd done, actually. (laughs) And and I've been to, like, events and stuff, and I've told a room of lawyers, I've been like, I can show you the entire moral law in a single diagram on a single piece of paper. And they're like, what? And I show it to them, and they were just like, wow, three years of law school wasted. (laughs) (laughs) So what are those circles? What's the progression? (laughs) So the first progression is... Um, I, you own, I own my body, mm-hmm. right? The, the body progression. I own my body. Any violation of the body, which would be anything around, you know, abuse, rape, murder, assault, right? Those, all those are moral crimes that we all recognize these are wrong, right? So the body is the first circle. That is our first primary, right? The next ring is my, I own my creations, right? Cause if I own something, I own whatever it produces. So I own, if I own a fruit tree, grows pears. I can take those pears. I own the pears, right? What do I do with the pears? I can take those pears and sell them. I can make an exchange, right? So the next ring is the exchange or the deal. And there's five principles in the law that govern a valid exchange. Meaning if these five principles don't exist, I cannot enforce this contract because I recognize that this, that enforcing that contract would be a violation of that other person's rights mm-hmm. if these five principles don't exist. So that's the next level. And when we're talking about cults and stuff, they're violating all of these principles, right? They're going to violate your body. They're going to violate your, um, your creations. They're going to try to say, you know, you need to give all your money to the group. You don't own your intellectual property rights, whatever it is, right? But the big one they're going to violate is the principle of the deal. And the five principles that you have to understand that are uh, with, encased within that principle of a valid deal uh, are you have to know what you're exchanging. You have to be clear on it. You both have to know what it is, right? If you're not both clear on, like, I can't be like, I'm selling my cell phone for $500 and, you know, you think I'm selling my lipstick, right? It That's not a valid exchange. We, we, we can't, there's no meeting of the minds there, yeah. right? But how does this happen all the time? You know, like some guy might think I'm taking you out to dinner so that I can have sex with you. Uh And the woman is thinking you're taking me out to dinner so that I can see if I even want to get to go out on a second date and get to know you at all. Right? Like, (laughs) you see, 
that we're not going into it with the same meeting of the minds of what's being exchanged. Yeah. There. So that happens all the time. The next one is that there actually has to be some exchange of value, right? There has to be, there ha well, there has to be an offer, right? Someone has to offer something. Someone has to have willingly accept it. There has to be an exchange of value. So for instance, if uh, an example of something where there's no exchange of value is a gift. I can't enforce a gift. Okay. But if I promise to do this and you pay me, right, I can enforce that. Uh -huh. Then I need to do what I said I was going to do, right? You paid me, right? So that's enforceable, right? That's the exchange of value. The other one, and this is, uh, is mental capacity, right? You have to have the mental capacity to understand what you're doing, which is why we don't allow children to uh, sign contracts, right? They can't understand the implication of their action, the far-reaching implication of their action, right? We also don't accept if someone has dementia, right? They don't have the mental capacity to understand what they're doing. This is why we have this whole field of like elder abuse and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And this is why we talk about uh, pedophilia, right? Some people are like, well, the child engaged in it willingly. Oh, they said please. yes. I'm like, you can't say yes. No, you know? they can't give consent. You don't have the capacity to make that decision as a child. Do you not have the mental capacity to understand what you're giving up, what you're doing, what that action is going to imply in trauma for the rest of your life? Like you, you don't, you can't make that decision. That's one of the elements you have to have the mental capacity to understand what you're doing in order to engage. And then finally, uh, no undue pressure. And, you know, when we, when we're talking about like deals, often we're looking at like undue pressure would be blackmail, right? But, uh, undue pressure in relationships is far more subtle. Well, we have emotional blackmail, right? Which we talk about a lot, um, you know, gaslighting, lying, peer pressure, guilting, right? All of this sort of stuff. This is all pressure, all negative pressure. And of course, in, in, you know, cults and organizations, it might also be fear of punishment. But if you're in law, if we're creating a valid deal or contract, we have to make sure each of those principles is not violated in order for that contract to be enforced. But when you look at it, those principles did not come from the field of contract. Those principles existed as principles long before we had the law. Mm -hmm. We understand that if somebody can't, you know, if they have dementia and they can't remember from one minute to the next, we can't hold them to a contract they signed, right? Like we just, we understand that that would be wrong, right? That's basically stealing. Yeah. You see, if someone's, you know, being blackmailed, we can't say, well, that's a valid contract because that's stealing. They're, they're being forced to do something they don't want to do, right? They're being forced to create an exchange they don't want to have. So those principles were enacted into law, but they, the principles came first. Mm -hmm. So when we learn to understand things from a principle basis, then we can even see when the laws are wrong because we have a lot of false laws on the books. We have a lot of laws that violate these principles. But when you understand the principles, you can see the laws that are accurate, right? That are good, that are valid, and you can see the laws that are wrong. Yeah. And then the final ring is, you know, how much responsibility do we have for things that we contribute to but are beyond our direct control? And that's a lot of the whole realm of tort law, right? So let's say I built a car where I knew that if you hit the car at the back left corner, the gas tank is going to explode. Well, I could say they shouldn't be hitting you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not my fault. I didn't hit you. Yeah. Right. But of course, we don't accept that. We say if you knew that there was a potential for a serious problem to explode and kill everybody, then you need to change the design. Yeah. You're responsible for that too. Yes, the person who hit you is responsible, but you're also responsible, right? So that's the, that's kind of the final ring is, is the implication, right? Of that. So, you know, and, and you can take it a step further and say, okay, well, how much was my grandfather responsible? Maybe he didn't go molest all these kids. You know, he molested some, but he taught people to do it. Yeah. Right. So how much is he also responsible? The people who molested the kids are responsible. It doesn't matter if they thought that it was okay and they were being taught you know, it doesn't matter. They still violated the principle, mm -hmm. right? And that violation is absolute. 
you are still wrong. It, was, it doesn't matter if you thought you were right, right? You can go kill somebody thinking you're right. You're still wrong. You still murdered them. Yeah. Okay. But there is also the element of how much responsibility does that person also bear, right? So it's like a mob killing. If the mob boss says, go kill somebody, and that person goes and kills them, knowing that they're going to do it, right? Not just like somebody on the street holding up a sign saying, oh, you know, crazy, go kill somebody, right? Nobody's going to listen to them. It's not, <laughs> right? When you're in some kind of position of authority and you tell someone to do something and they go do it, you are responsible as well. Yeah. Right? And we recognize that in the law. So when you think about anything we consider a moral crime, it will fit in one of those circles. Wow. That's very comprehensive. Well done. I'm extremely impressed. <laughs> and now I guess all that we have left is to talk about how you're doing. I mean, clearly you're thriving and you're killing it out there and you're teaching all these lawyers what's what. And I love it. <laughs> but as far as you personally, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. You know, I think I'm so grateful for my life. And and I was so grateful years and years ago, even before I got to this stage, before I wrote the book, it was like, I reached a point in my life where I realized I was really grateful for everything. And even the bad, you know, people don't always understand that. I'm like, no, I'm really grateful. The rapes, the abuse, everything. I'm really grateful because I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't have the understanding that I have. You know, I wouldn't see how strong I am if I hadn't experienced uh, some of those things. I wouldn't understand what others go through if I hadn't experienced some of those things myself, you know? And it, it, I think when you can get to a point where you're grateful, um, it really can shift your whole life, you know? And it's not that it, I don't recognize that, that, you know, people did wrong. Um, but in my heart, I didn't want to have to carry that mm -hmm. every, everywhere. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't, I was a victim, but I didn't have to continue to be a victim, mm -hmm. you know? And when you continue to give other people power over you by demanding that they apologize or they, you know, they do this, that, and the other, you're just continuing to give your power away. I was like, no, whatever they did to me, they did. Whatever I did, I did, whatever, you know, but now it's, I'm the only one that can fix this. <laughs> I'm the only one that can do anything about it right now. So I choose, I want to be happy. I'm going to go out there and find a way to fix it. And I spent years and years, um, you know, doing all kinds of self-help stuff and programs and like, you know, healing exercises. And, and when I wrote the book, I own me, which is on my website, I put in that book, I met, fortunately I met some amazing people along the way. I met a lot of duds. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of stuff that didn't really work. <laughs> you just got to keep trying, yeah. you know? And then I found some people who were fantastic. I mean, there's one woman, Lyra Kay. She's just brilliant uh, in her understanding of the human mind and trauma and stuff. And, you know, I, I did her stuff. And, you know, so I, I put the things I found, like, those were kind of the shortcuts <laughs> that worked. I mean, there, there's no shortcut to healing. There really isn't. You have to actually do the work and do and heal. But... Um, the things I felt like had a bigger impact on me than others. I put those in, I put some of those in the book so that people could do it for themselves, but you have to work it. And I think one thing that really helped me too, was that I always believed in God. I always had a strong, felt like I had a strong connection to God. And after I left and I lost, you know, faith in, in everything else, pretty much, you know, the doctrines, the beliefs, you know, the Bible, I couldn't even like, really, it was, it was so full of everything from everybody else, you know, everybody's interpretations of it, which yeah. were so wrong. Um, I still always had this strong sense in a, in a loving creator who existed, who watched out for me, you know, and I think that definitely helped pull me through a lot of stuff when I was younger, that belief system, um, and later in life too. And I, I had pretty much like just everything else was like, I had to deconstruct everything else I believed in, <laughs> you know, but you know, I, I'm at a point now, which is like, it's almost like coming back full circle in an, in another way. Cause like my husband, I got married recently and, um, I, 
I, you know, I'm pregnant and I can have a baby. And these are all these things that I wanted for so long, for so many years. And I think a lot of people who grew up and suffered abuse, they, they struggled to achieve some of this stuff, you know, good, healthy relationships, loving partnership. And, and, um, sometimes it's easier to be successful <laughs> in a, in a, uh, like professional way, right. Yeah. <laughs> than it is on the relationship side. We all have different things we struggle with. And so I'm very grateful to, you know, be at this point now in my life where I finally have that. And it does take a lot of, you know, peeling back the the hard shell that you can create after being hurt and abused and your trust damaged over and over and over again. You know, how do you release that? How do you really learn to trust mm -hmm. and, and learn to have a healthy relationship? And so that's been a, that's, that's a process that takes years. It's not like it just happens, you know, you actually got to do the work. Um, but one of the interesting things with my husband is that he, he comes from a, a background, he, um, you know, he very had very deep faith in God and in the Bible. And at first I was like, like, I really appreciated him. He has good morals. I don't worry about him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he knows what it is to be a man, which is very hard to find in this world today. Um, I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I can, like the Bible, I don't know if I can hear the Bible stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and for years I was just like, yeah, please don't talk to me about that. <laughs> um, but he challenged me to take a look at it in a different way. And so I began to go back um, and study it completely differently. And I realized that there were so many things I was taught. Almost everything I was taught was not actually really in the Bible. Mm. You know, <laughs> all of these doctrines, all of these concepts, all of this stuff. I was like, oh my God, that's actually, you know, and it was such a shock to me. And I told him at the time, I said, look, I'll go on the journey of, of restudying this, you know, and, but it, if it fits within what I consider something that's morally correct, I will accept it. If it doesn't, I won't. <laughs> And, uh, and I made that very clear. And so it's been an interesting journey for me the last couple of years to start restudying this stuff and all of these concepts and seeing all of the stuff that we're taught, like uh, even stuff that most churches, most religions believe, totally not there. And yeah. how people and religious groups have used those false concepts that don't even exist in the Bible to control and manipulate people through fear. That to me, I was like, wow, you know, actually, you know, you read Proverbs and stuff. It's actually really very accurate. There's a lot of really wise sayings in there that are true, you know, <laughs> like, you know but, but then this concept of, you know, eternal damnation or people burning in hell or, you know, that, that's actually not in the Bible. It doesn't exist. Like when you study the origin of the word and the term, the Hebrews didn't believe you had a spirit that existed after death. Right. That's why to them, the resurrection was so important. When you died, you died. Mm -hmm. Like, and you can read, there's many verses in the Bible that say that all thought stops. That's it. You're dead. Right. And if you get resurrected, you get resurrected into, you know, this paradise. Right. That's the concept. You're not resurrected into hell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the whole concept of the lake of fire and a, it's actually, when you really translate it accurately, it would be the lake of oblivion. It just means you disappear. Just like a fire breaks everything down to its molecules and you're just gone, right? It means you disappear. You, you don't come back, Interesting. right? Interesting. It's not this like you're going to be tortured forever and ever, right? It's a, all of the, and that's how people control you through the fear. But yeah. if you recognize, okay, wait, you know, that actually doesn't exist in the Bible. How am I going to, how am I going to scare you? <laughs> <laughs> to do what I want. <laughs> right? Yeah. You lose your tools. <laughs> you lose the torture tools, you know? So it, it's been a very interesting discovery for me. And, and so many times I'll be reading something and it'll be like, an, like the Bible will say exactly, don't do this. And it's exactly what like the Catholic church does or, you know, <laughs> some other religious group. They're like literally doing it exactly. It says it right there. Don't ever do that. <sighs> and they're doing it. And I'm like, how are you reconciling this yeah. at all? Right? <laughs> You know, so it's just been very interesting for me to go back and see that so much of what I was taught was in the Bible or was a biblical doctrine was not that at all. Mm -hmm. it doesn't exist. Not when you, and you have to get past the bias of the translators as well. You know, unfortunately I'm a lawyer, so I enjoy deep digging and studying, but that bias is in the translations itself. You literally have to, you know, 
use Bible Hub or something to go down and find the original Greek terms and Hebrew terms and look at their multiple meanings and like pretty much translate it yourself <laughs> to a large extent. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. But it's um, to me, that kind of work is important and fascinating yeah. because I don't like people using things against me or to manipulate me that they've translated in a way that justifies their concept of what it is, right? Mm -hmm. And that they can use it. And then that's exactly what happened in the family. My grandfather took all these verses, he twisted the meaning of them, he created his own interpretation, and that's what he used to beat everybody over the head with and get them to do what he wanted, yep. right? And that's that's what every, almost every religion does that. Yeah. So you have to be willing to like step outside of religion in, to a large extent. And, you know, if you're going to go after studying it, you've got to be able to do it like kind of outside of that. I love it. It's so <laughs> cool that you're still using your fire for education and learning and expansion into just digging in more deeply and finding what works for you and finding your peace and your happiness. And it sounds like you have. And that's just so amazing. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us and your concepts and your principles. I found it so interesting and I'm sure everyone else will as well. So before we go, I need your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement or inspiration. I think the two things I like to always share with people is that it doesn't matter the abuse you suffered. You can be happy. You can recover. You can live a good life. Yeah. You know, there are techniques, things, people who can help you to overcome that stuff if you are absolutely determined to do so. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, that's one thing that's very, very important. The other thing is question everything. You know, I, I tell people, question everything. Do not accept what people are telling you at face value, whether it's a religion, a group, a political statement, the news, you know, like question it all. Because if you take action on something that is false, you can truly harm yourself or harm others. Like, and that's what happened in the, in the family, right? I mean, all of these, my parents and these people were taking action based on things that they believed were true, that someone told them was true, and they were creating abuse yeah. for themselves and others. And just because we think we're a good person or we're trying to do the right thing, if we don't have principles, which is why I created that principle framework, like compare everything you do against that framework. Is it violating one of the principles? Compare everything your leaders do against that framework. Is it violating the principle? Um, means you have to have something that's objective. And when you go on after something, you study it, you dig deep into it. Yeah. Use that objective principles to discover what is true, because if you're acting on things that you believe to be true, but they are false, then you're just going to create more harm in your life mm -hmm. and the lives of others. So that's why I try to say question everything and have an objective standard that you can compare it to. Yes. Well said. I couldn't agree more. Do you have any other final thoughts before we go? Ah, uh, Just remember, I own me. You own yourself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you guys, if you want to check out her books, you can go to her websites. So faithjones.com and also sexcultnun.com where you can find her books. I'll also link everything in the description so you can find them. And her Instagram is I am Faith Jones. And I think that's about it. It's been a and pleasure. And the TEDx talk, which oh, is yes, called of I course. Am Me Too. Yeah, we'll link that as well. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Faith. Thank you so much for your time today. Likewise. And thank you for the good work that you're doing and, um, you know, helping people get their stories out there, sharing principles, shining light on this stuff so that people can see, um, you know, and, and helping people to understand, not just like see if they are maybe in a situation that is harmful um, and, and see paths to get out um, and techniques and, you know, other things like that. It's just such an important uh, 
such an important role that you have sharing this information with others. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, thank you. We really appreciate the support. And guys, if you're watching and you want to support the channel and also Faith leaving those comments really does help boost the algorithm. And it's so nice to have our guests be able to read some words of encouragement from you guys. And another way to support the podcast is getting some of our merch at cultsofconsciousness.com under the merch tab. We have some fun stuff over there. You can come to Costa Rica with us, which is going to be awesome. Next year, we have that go. Going. You can sign up using the link in the description. We have a few spots left. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. If you like this video, click these two down below. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. <laughs>